afternoon. Thank you very much for coming. You know, uh, one of the reasons that we started the, uh, that the Latino Network started was to get people talking to each other. And what we rudely do is that once you get stuck talking to each other at a, at a certain volume, we then say, cut in and say, it's time to start. Uh, everybody needs to be quiet. We'd like to ask that everyone mute their phones so that unless you're an emergency call or something that uh, things don't get interrupted. Um, my name is Jess Avera. I'm with the Latino Network. Uh, the Latino Network was uh, founded in 1989, so we are in our finishing up our 28th year of monthly luncheons. Uh, we're, uh, <laughs> Founding members, we're thinking Rosalina Regalado, who was the chief founder. We have other members in the, of the committee here, but we'll introduce them at, at the end. You know, what we try to do is, is provide an opportunity to have a, a, a conversation with people who make decisions, people who offer services, people who are in the community who get services, to, because sometimes we start services, offer services, but sometimes it don't make sense to the community. And it's important for the community to have a voice, to have an opportunity to talk about what's taking place. And each of you, although you may not be a recipient of the services that, um, that your organization provides, each of you is a conduit of people in the community to decision makers, policy makers, heads of organizations, people who are doing significant things. And so you provide a voice for your community, for our community. You know, we are interested in things that affect the entire community, but we have a special focus on the Latino community. Things that affect our importance and, and um, help the community navigate through all the things that are taking place. We're right now in a very challenging time a time full of opportunities to, to make things better. You know, today we are honored to have, you know, a key player in in all the things that, that are taking place, you know, our representative, our community's voice to the powers that be across the country. Uh, Congressman Jimmy Panella is here today. He, he obviously didn't start here start today, he has a history, he, he um, got a law degree, he joined in 2007, he joined the armed services, was deployed to Af Afghanistan in Operation Iraqi Freedom, he earned the Bronze Star there, he's been a district attorney here, he's a member of that house, armed services, so many, so many different things. Armed services. I lost my notes. I'll get them. Just in a short time in, in Congress, the word looks like a blooming career. He's already involved in very important committees that make decisions about allocation, about policies, about research, resources that affect every one of us. And so today we'd like to welcome uh, Jimmy. Congressman Jimmy Panetta, I'd like to ask you, you know, is it a nonprofit group or you know, we'd like to ask you to keep questions as nonpartisan as possible. <laughs> so uh, uh, you said don't don't put us, anyone on the on the spot of having to take one side or the other, but really have a discussion about what's taking place in Washington DC and and have an opportunity to talk about that with you. So thank you very much for coming. We welcome you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Jess, and uh, thank you for saying that the questions have to be bipartisan. But I guess I could be a little partisan. <laughs> but I, but you'll see uh, what I, what what I will eventually talk about is uh, is the bipartisanship that I believe is needed in Congress. But uh, obviously, thank you, Jess. Thanks to all of you for being here. Thanks for you to coming together, uh, networking, and obviously creating uh, what I believe is a, 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 an important part of this community. 
Uh, obviously, you coming together, talking about the issues, and making sure everybody knows about the issues. I think that's very important. It's a first step in order to get things done. So thank you very much for the taking time out of your daily lives to come in here uh, and be a part of this group, and also today for coming in and, and listening to me. So thank you for this opportunity to, to present to you. Um, you know, I've, I've been asked to kind of give you sort of what's called like a, a legislative update. Uh, what's been going on for the past nine months? And, you know, it's funny because when people, before they get to that question of how is it, they always look at me and they say, God, I feel sorry for you as a <laughs> member in this atmosphere of what's going on. And, and look, I mean, the, the fact is, is that I understand that sentiment. Because the fact is, is that it has been a world. It has been a little crazy as to what's going on. And it definitely is a little nutty uh, back in Washington, D.C. But I can tell you, it's pretty much been like that ever since I stepped foot in D.C. Uh, literally the week after the election, uh, we had new member orientation. And it was, uh, you know, about 23 Democrats, about 27 Republicans. Uh, going there and basically getting uh, assimilated as to what acclimated as to what it's like to be a member. Uh, fortunately, I kind of had a little uh, advantage uh, based on uh, my time in D.C. and that I actually knew certain things that a lot of other members didn't. Like, there is an underground tunnel from our office buildings to the Capitol, and I knew where to go. And so that kind of, that, that people kind of turned to me and said, well, where the hell are we going? Like, Just follow me. So, <laughs> Uh, and then, you know, after those couple weeks, uh, January 3rd, we literally raised our hand and we took the oath. And we got sworn in on January 3rd as Congress members in the 150th Congress. Um, and that was, you know, obviously exciting, exhilarating. But literally, right out of the chute, we were voting. We voted within an hour of raising our hand. And we pretty much voted consistently and constantly ever since then. Uh, and I will go ahead and just to put it out there, if anybody has an idea of how many times we've actually pressed that button since January 3rd. Anybody have a guess? 568 times. 568 times we've actually voted. Now, not all of those votes have to do with legislation, but, you know, amendments, resolutions, rules, things like that. But I make it a point, and I rely on my staff to make it a point, to basically know exactly what I'm going into, exactly what I'm voting on uh, when it comes to uh, each time I press that button. You have to be. So it's constantly keeping up with that. And like I said, that's every day, sometimes multiple times throughout the day we're doing that. And then came January 20th with literally, as I like to say, the, the disorientation of the Trump administration and this constant feeling that you're having to respond to things that come out of the administration. I mean, you had his cabinet picks to his advisors that have resigned. You've had executive orders that have basically threatened the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, and you've had basically an equivocation on what happened in Charlottesville. You had uh, basically people standing up to the, the Russia involvement in our investigation, to a controversy over people kneeling when it comes to our national anthem. Uh, you've had threats to completely annihilate a uh, country due to the constant tweets uh, that are out there. You've had the maligning of his own, the president's own party's leaders, leadership to having Chinese food and a potential deal with Chuck and Nancy, the Democratic leadership. And so it's kind of been all over the place. And it has been, I admit, it's not an excuse, but you have to probably agree, that it's been a distraction. And let me tell you, there's a lot to do in Congress. And there still is a lot to do. I mean, put it, let me just give you a rundown of things that we have to possibly tackle, we should, some we need to, some we might have to, tackle before December. We have to fund the government by December 8th. We have to, we have to raise the debt ceiling by November 8th. We have to deal with our dreamers by December 8th. We have to deal with shoring up the individual market of the ACA because of the President's executive order last week of stopping the cost sharing reduction subsidies. Uh, we possibly have to deal with tax reform. And wouldn't it be nice if there may be something to do with infrastructure in there as well? So there's a lot of things 
that need to get done. But unfortunately, as I'd like to say, and as I feel, we're governing at this time by flurry and not focus. And in my limited time that I've seen, it, you know, we need focus. But it's hard because you're kind of all over the place. And it reminds me of this joke that I often heard as an, an Italian uh, that I call the Mamino joke. And it's about this Italian son who was having a hard time keeping a girlfriend. And so he goes to see a psychologist. And the doctor sits him down and says, what's going on? And he says, well, you know, I, I can't keep a girlfriend because each time I bring this girlfriend home, my Italian mother can't stand her. So the psychologist thinks about it and says, why don't you go out and find a girl that's just like your mom? Great. The mamino goes out, finds this young, wonderful young lady, brings her home, and you know, everything's going pretty well. So he goes and sees the psychologist again. The psychologist says, how's it going? Mamino says, you know what, I found this wonderful young lady, and let me tell you, she looks like my mom, she talks like my mom, she cooks like my mom, and you know what, my mom loves her. And the psychologist says, great, then what's the problem? Mamino says, well now my dad can't stand her. <laughs> Sometimes you feel like that in Congress. Because everybody's kind of, you know, one side saying the other, the other side saying the other thing. And you're, you know, you're, you're a little up in the air. But the fact is, is that, you know, despite that, there is a sense. And as I, when I walked in here, you felt that, I, I heard it from some people. There really is a sense of sort of a deconstruction of what's going on. A divisiveness, as well as distraction. And, and the example I'll give you is just, let's look what just happened last week. This is in one week. Let me read you a list of things that happened. We withdrew from the Clean Power Plan, a plan that was supposed to cut uh, emissions by 30% by 2030. We, uh, they, the administration rolled back transgender protection. The administration repealed employer birth control mandates. The administration put forward these very stringent immigration principles out of, the, out of their office. It stopped the, the cost-sharing reduction subsidies I mentioned. It decertified the Iran deal, a major international deal that we were a part of. Uh, he had a picture, the president had a picture with all his military generals, and he quoted, and he said, this is the calm before the storm. We were bearing victims of our most tragic shooting incident in Las Vegas. We were still dealing with recovery efforts of the hurricanes in Houston and Puerto Rico, and in California we were dealing with the most destructive and de a deadly wildfires in our history. And so yes, it feels like there's just this devastation, this deconstruction, this divisiveness that's going on around us. So much so that last week in the New York Times, an editorialist by the name of David Brooks wrote an editorial and it was titled, We Used to Build Things. We Used to Build Things. And the purpose of his editorial, he talked about how there was this big burn back in the early 1900s. That uh, fire that burned from Washington, Oregon, and up into Idaho, into Montana. And from that tragedy came the U.S. Forest Service. And when you think about things like that, how we used to build things, you think about basically the history of our country and that we have always had civic institutions, created civic institutions to help people. We have always advanced ideas of freedom and democracy. We have always embraced people, including our huddled masses, yearning to breathe free. And we have emboldened them to realize their powers. And I believe that that is why the world embraced us. And that is why the world looked to the United States for its enlightened leadership. And that is what made us exceptional. But unfortunately, obviously, we don't feel like that at certain times, especially now. With so much distraction, so much devastation, and so much de uh, de deconstruction, you can't help but ask the question of when are we going to build things? And when are we going to do it together? It's an understandable question, especially in this atmosphere right now, how we're feeling. But I can tell you, I can give back to you, 
But the fact is, is that in the past nine months, I've gotten to meet my fellow congressional members and get to know them and work with them. And I can tell you that there are members back in Washington, D.C., on both sides of the aisle, Democrats and Republicans, who are yearning to start to build it. And more importantly, to do it together. Now, I can tell you, it's not easy. It's not easy. And let me tell you why. The first, the, I talked about that new member orientation where we all got back there. So we get back there the week after uh, the election. And we all, back, like I said, Democrats, Republicans, we get in the room. And what's the first thing that happens to us? What is leadership on both sides of the aisle? What do they do to us? They put the Democrats on this side of the room, and they put the Republicans over there. And for two weeks, we were separated. Not being able to get to know one another, not being able to get to talk to one another. And we were getting a little antsy. What the hell's going on here? We want to get to know the people we're going to be working with. It wasn't until we got up to Harvard where we did a symposium that third week at the John F. Kennedy School of Government. And we actually kept us in the room and we were talking to one another, we were joking and having a good time. And it was at that point that we actually kicked leadership out of the room because we wanted to have frank conversations, especially after what they did to us back in Washington, D.C. And I can tell you, what I heard from my Republican counterparts, my Republican peers, the same things that I heard from many of you back in the campaign trail, the same things that I hear from you to this day, the same things that they hear from their constituents in their districts, and that it is time for us to start getting stuff done, and more importantly, doing it together. And I can tell you, there's a foundation being built upon which we can do that. Now, first of all, let me tell you that what I know, and what I can tell you from the Congress members back there, our number one priority is our districts, okay? Our constituents in the districts. That's why I'm here in front of you. Because I certainly believe that my number one priority are all of you, serving all of you, being that bridge from the central coast of California to the services of Washington, D.C., our government, and back. That's our job. I learned that early on, being raised in the household that I was, seeing how my mother and my father, my mother was his district director, worked their butts off to serve the people of this district. And that's why people still to this day come up to me and tell me stories about how they were served by their congressmen. And these were stories that this, this didn't just didn't happen five or ten years ago. These are stories that happened 20, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, I'll never forget two stories in particular. Uh, Bill Monkovich, I was up at the Chamber of Commerce Theater in Montsonville. Bill Monkovich, uh, the ag industry guy, strawberry grower, he came up to me, pulled me out from my table and said, I gotta tell you something. Okay, thank you. And he said, Jimmy, back in the floods of 82, my farm was wiped out. Okay? He said, yeah, I didn't know what to do. And so you know what I did? I called my congressman. Three days later, I got a call from the Small Business Administration. Six months later, I got a loan from the SBA. And because of that loan, Look at me now. I'm the biggest strawberry farmer in the Palm Grove Valley. About a month after that, I was out at the Strawberry Festival there in Watsonville. And this gentleman comes up to me and he says, uh, Jimmy, uh, I got to tell you, your dad saved my marriage. I went, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> What's this guy going to say? He said, yeah. He said, you know, I got to tell you, I was uh, an immigrant from Mexico. And I came here and I'm, I was on my way. I got my green card. I was on my way to getting my citizenship. But I met my fiance. We were picking strawberries in the fields, and she was from, he said, Nicaragua. And she was about to be deported. And we didn't know what to do. So we went to my congressman's office. And you know what? We were able to get her a green card. She got her citizenship, and we got married. And it was funny. This is a true story. He, he then goes to tell me, he said, yeah, but she ended up leaving with me oh, at the time. No. He was like, what? <laughs> I said, I said, why did you tell me that story? I go, that's, that's too bad. He said, you know what? That's not the point. It's not the point. The point is that when I needed something, when it came to something that was important to me and my wife, I went to my congressman's office and got it. And so my number one priority is serving my constituents. And I can tell you we've been doing that for the past nine months. Last year, Sam Farr, in his office, he had 41,000 forms of communication into his office. 41,000. Emails, telephone calls, walk-ins, letters, whatever. 41,000. This year, in nine months, we've had 82,000. So obviously people have been very active. They've wanted to tell us how they feel and uh, what we should do and so on and so forth. But a majority of those have been also caseworkers that were actually opening up caseworkers files and basically helping people with be it an immigration benefit, be it a veterans benefit, things of that nature, things that the government can help them. But I can also tell you that back in Washington, D.C., we're coming together on certain pieces of legislation. 
especially when it comes to our veterans. Uh, we have passed and the President has signed some major forms of legislation when it comes to serving our veterans. The Clear Choice Act, making it easier, easier for veterans to get medical care when the VA is backed up. They can then go to a private doctor. Now we're lucky around here. One, because Congressman Sam Farr had the wherewithal to get that VA DOD clinic built right over here in Marina. But two, we're lucky in Palo Alto. We have a pretty good system up there. But there are other parts of the country that basically don't have as good as care as we do for our veterans. And that's why they sometimes need to go to private uh, doctors to do that. We, we allow them to do this. We made it easier to expedite appeals if you're denied benefits. We made it easier to hire and deal with difficult employees within the VA. We passed the GI Forever Bill saying that if you have, if you're a veteran and you have your GI benefits, no longer is it just 15 years, but you can take advantage of those veteran of those benefits throughout your life. And myself and Republican Congressman Neil Dunn authored and got out, passed out of the House unanimously a bill that says that if you're a veteran-owned small business, you have priority when it comes to dealing with the government and contracting with the GSA. Uh, it's those types of legend pieces of legislation that, although you may turn on the TV and you may hear some a lot of divisiveness, I can tell you that things are getting done in Congress, especially when it comes to our veterans. I'm also seeing it with the committees that I'm on. Uh, I was on the Natural Resources Committee for about the first six months. Uh, that is a pretty partisan committee, I can tell you that right now. A lot of the votes came down where the Republicans were on this side, Democrats on this side. But my first piece of legislation that I offered and put through had to deal with the Clear Creek Management Area in South San Benito County. Basically, it had been closed. We put forward legislation to open it up. 60,000 acres to off-road vehicles, including another 20,000 acres for protection, uh, to put aside for wildlife purposes. And that took me actually going to Republicans, talking to Republicans, talking to the chairman, Rob Bishop, sitting in his office, telling him about the benefits of the bill, getting Jeff Denham, Republican from the Valley, David Valadeo, Steve Knight, Republicans from the Valley, neighboring on San Benito County, to basically be co-sponsors. And they are. And that's why it passed unanimously, unanimously out of the natural resources, and it passed unanimously out of the House of Representatives, and is now in the Senate where we're working with Feinstein and Harris to get that thing moving out of the Senate and hopefully out of the president. I'm seeing bipartisanship on the committee I am on now, Armed Services Committee. Uh, basically, it's, it's kind of funny. So I admit, I am the lowest ranking member on the Armed Services Committee, a Panetta. But guess what? On the majority side, the lowest ranking member, Lynn Cheney, Dick Cheney's daughter. Too. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty ironic. Uh, but nevertheless, we're working together on this. And in my role as representative of this area, with all the major military installations that we have here, it's my role to make sure that one, they're funded, two, that they continue to play a part in our national security, which I believe they have they, as they have been, they will continue to be, because I believe that no longer is our military just about planes, tanks, and guns. It's about leadership, it's about cyber warfare, it's about the weather, it's about languages. We have all those here, MPS, DLI, uh, the weather station, the Navy Research Lab, uh, the, our connection with the Silicon Valley, working on cyber Street. We have that all here. And I tell you, when I talk to people who work in the Pentagon, they actually come here, they actually work, uh, they actually see what we have here. The response I always get is, you guys have a treasure chest out there. And you bet we do. And it's also my responsibility to make sure that they continue to remain here, do not undergo any sort of brack and continue a base realignment and closure bills, and continue to play a part in our national security. That's important. And then I'm also seeing bipartisanship definitely on my, I actually, my favorite committee, I have to admit, is the Ag Committee, Agriculture Committee. That was my number one choice, and I got on that right away. And there's something about it that just speaks to me. I really appreciate being on that committee, because if there's something I see being from, and you can ask anybody on that committee where Panetta is from, they will tell you it's from the salad bowl of the world. Because I always say that. After each, each, each question, I always preface it. Somehow I work it in there. So that so our Republicans are like throwing stuff. Like, stop, get out of here. But it's true. They know I'm from the salad bowl of the world. You know we have specialty crops here. Obviously, immigration is a big issue. And obviously, we're dealing with a shrinking and aging workforce. Unfortunately, in the Ag Committee, we're not dealing with immigration. But we are dealing with making sure that our specialty crops are protected. And that's what I'm doing. We're working on the 2018 Farm Bill, and I need to make sure that we have the appropriate funding for our specialty crops, our organics, 
research and development when it comes to pests and disease, but also research and development when it comes to mechanization. Okay, like I said, we're dealing with a small workforce here, unfortunately, based on the atmosphere that we're living in right now. And if you talk to anybody in ag, they will tell you the number one issue is not water, but immigration, labor. And what I believe is what the private industry has done here is they've reached out from the Salinas Valley to the Silicon Valley to start developing technology when it comes to mechanization. Not to replace labor, but unfortunately to replace the lack of labor. Because that's what we're dealing with. Millions of dollars of crops have been lost because we don't have the workforce here. And I believe that's something we can look into. And I believe that that's also why that I and a Republican, Rodney Davis, from Illinois, Congressman from Illinois, have started to uh, started and we're co-chairing the Ag Research Caucus. Uh, he and I are co-chairs, and there's 30 members, bipartisan, uh, by actually more Republicans than Democrats because of the Ag interest in them, uh, of this committee that's focused on Ag research, research in agriculture. He's actually probably going to come out here in February, and we're going to kind of do a kickoff about it, and probably bring in some, bring in some people, obviously, in Slings Valley and Silicon Valley, to talk about what we're doing in ag research, as well as people at the ag research station over here in Salinas. Um, and so I'm not only seeing that on the committees, it's working together on the committees, I'm seeing it in the caucuses that I'm on. I'm on the climate, I'm on a number of caucuses, some partisan, Oceans Caucus, mainly the Democrats, the Trails Caucus, mainly the Democrats, Planned Parenthood Caucus, LGBTQ Caucus, mostly Democratic Caucus. But I'm also on caucuses that are purely bipartisan. And what I mean by that is there's the same number of Democrats as Republicans that are on those caucuses. One, the Climate Solutions Caucus. You would think, partisan caucus. No, it's a purely bipartisan caucus. Same amount of Democrats, the same amount of Republicans. There has to be in order to join that. Now I admit, it wasn't easy finding a Republican to join with me on that caucus. My first choice that I had was a Congress member from Jacksonville. Uh, Florida, with the, dealing with the rising sea levels, you know, they're a little more prone to the effects of climate change. So I, I talked to this representative from Jacksonville. I said, do you want to join the caucus? By the Solutions Caucus. He says, yeah, that sounds great. Have your staff call my staff. Okay, fine. I go back, have my staff call the staff. First time, no response. Second time, no response. Call them back. Third time, get a staff, and the staff says, the congressman isn't ready to join the Climate Solutions Caucus at this time. Okay, fine. So I think of, who else can I target? Scott Taylor, former Navy SEAL, represents Norfolk, Virginia. Literally, I had read in National Geographic that Norfolk was dealing with dry day flooding effects of rising sea levels. Not only a public security for his district, it's a national security issue because what's in Norfolk? A major Navy base at sea level, dealing with those effects. Went and talked to him. He says, yeah, you know what, I'd be interested in that. Have your staff call mine. So I go back and I tell my staff to call his staff. They do one time, don't get a response. I said, stop, let me deal with it. That day we had boats on the house floor. I go down, I cross the aisle, I sit down with Scott, we have a conversation about it. Scott is my counterpart now on the Climate Solutions Conference. But that's what it takes. And we're actually having discussions about the effects of climate change, be it on the economy, be it on the environment, uh, with, uh, there with Republicans at the same table. Very beneficial. I'm not saying we're gonna have any major piece of legislation coming out of there at that right now. But it's starting these conversations. It's building that foundation to do it. It's also why I'm on the Problem Solvers Cup. Another purely bipartisan caucus. 23 Democrats, 23 Republicans. And I enjoy it because, one, we meet most often. It's a caucus where I'm putting in the most work. But two, we're actually dealing with issues that affect us. Major issues. Healthcare. Now at first, I have to say, when, when, when the Republicans were putting forward their efforts to repeal yeah. the ACA, I was kind of looking around going, because I had heard from many of you that, yes, the ACA has benefited the Central Coast. Hands down. We are lucky to have it here based on the uninsured rate. We've gone down from 21% to 9%, creation of over 6,500 jobs locally, California, nationally. The ACA has been a good thing. But I also know, and I also heard from you, that it's very expensive. We're basically shrinking our accessibility to doctors as a, as a part of it. 
And when I saw that last, that this year, 2017, the number one area that had the highest spike in rates under covered California, San Benito, Monterey, Santa Cruz counties, 24% rate hike. The second was San Francisco at 14%. It needs to be repaired and not repealed. So getting back to the Republicans constantly trying to repeal it, my take was, no, we need to repair it. What are the Democrats' plans? And I went to leadership, and I asked them, what's our plan to mend, to mend it, not end it? What's our plan? And the attitude was, well, uh, have you ever seen Muhammad Ali fight? You kind of call the rope a dope, where he basically, they hit you, and they hit you, and they hit you, and tell me you gotta go, you gotta ground up and everything. <laughs> but they, they hit you and hit you until you get tired, and then you just fall down. Now wisely, I get it, because look at all the efforts, what happened to the Republican efforts to repeal it. It's not even including the 57 times they tried to do it before January, but with the AHCA, with the uh, uh, budget, uh, what's it called, the Better Care Reconciliation Act, this recent one about the Graham Cassidy bill, they've fallen flat, they've fallen flat. But I believe we needed to do something, and that's why I joined this Problem Solvers Caucus, because we were actually talking about what we can do. And we came up with principles that we then put forward and dealt with the, you know, the senators, Patty Murray, Lamar Alexander, who we heard actually came up with a compromise recently, yesterday. And it's making sure that, that those principles get put forward. And that's why I'm glad to be a part of that caucus. We're also, I'm also on a working group within the Problem Solvers, dealing with the, our dreamers. And basically, in making sure, and at, at, at the stories that I hear from our dreamers here in Hartnell College, nearly 900 dreamers go to Hartnell. If Hartnell was a state, it'd be ranked number 39 in the number of dreamers in this country. Unbelievable. But you know, I met with them, I met with them yesterday, I met with them back in September, and basically talked to them and let them know we're fighting for them. And in Washington, D.C., there are Democrats and Republicans who are working together to make sure there's a deal on that as well. Okay? Uh, look, I, these are small steps. I admit that. But I tell you these stories about what's being done in Washington, D.C., about the bipartisan. Because even though you're feeling this destruction and devastation, divisiveness, there are members of Congress who actually want to build things. Uh, so what I say to people who say, you know, I feel sorry for you, I say don't. Don't. Because this is the best job I've ever had in the nine months that I've been there. Best job I've ever had that. Why? Yes, I get to serve you, but two, the people I work with on both sides of the aisle. Democrats and Republicans. Some really good people right back there who want to build things. And we are building things. We're building relationships, personal relationships, professional relationships. We're building that bridge across party lines. And we continue to make sure that Washington, D.C. is that bridge from our people in our district, from the Central Coast, back to a government that I believe and always will be a government of, by, and for the people. Thank you. You got a subject to questions now? Questions, is that it? Yes. Okay. Question. Yes, in, the, in the past years, I forget, was it 70s, 80s, about the 60s, about mechanization and farm work. So now that there is a reality that less people coming in to do this hard work, they sacrifice their life and their health to do this work. Have you thought about retraining, is there retraining money for those who are legal or yeah. have been working for the plant? Years. You have ways to or retraining? Well, you, okay, so you're asking a couple of different things there. I mean, yeah. obviously, <laughs> look, I, look, I think the best way to deal with the labor issue right now is immigration reform. Hands down, okay? Unfortunately, the last time Congress actually passed immigration reform was when? 1986. Exactly. 1986, Republican President Ronald Reagan. And that is what has put us in this situation that we are in, with the close to 11 million undocumented, with the, the, for the reasons why we're having a shrinking and aging workforce. All right, but you have to understand that it, it is easy, politically easy. It is the right thing to do. Therefore, it is politically easy.
for me, as a representative of the Central Coast, to fight for immigration reform, comprehensive immigration reform. Fight for our dreamers. But you have to understand that it is not, it is politically tough, actually, for members in other districts throughout this nation. I had a member of leadership, Republican leadership, in my office talking about immigration because I wanted to basically feel him out and try to push him towards the DREAM Act. And his response to me was, why would I give DREAMer citizenship? Now, because basically they're cutting in the line, is what he, cutting in line is what he said. And so I go into my, you know, I tell them basically about the people here in this community and what they're doing and, you know, I give them the story of the dreamers that I've come across that are contributing to our community, to our country, and I believe our culture is concerned. And his follow-up response was, well, Jim, in my district, I don't even have to touch this district. I don't have to touch this issue. It's politically safe for me not to do anything on this issue. That's who we're dealing with, Okay. So it's a tough issue. So that's why, basically, you know, I'd love to have comprehensive immigration reform. I don't know if we're going to get that, especially in the 115th Congress. But if we can help our dreamers, that'd be great. Now, in regards to, so that's why I think it's, you know, there are two paths here that we can deal with this issue in regards to immigration and labor. Uh, immigration is one path we've got to work on. But I believe that mechanization is there. And with that comes retraining as well. Because those are going to be high-paying jobs. And there's still going to be people. I mean, I was out at Hartnell, uh, the East Campus of Hartnell College last month. They got some great programs going on back there. I mean, some great career technical education that is basically training them how to deal with some of these machines and getting them accustomed to not just uh, working them, but actually fixing them. And that's what we're going to need. And, you know, I mean, I hear these, these, these proposals from Senators Tom Cotton and, and Purdue. Uh, about basically, no, no, we need immigration based on a skilled workforce. And then they need to come out here and get in the fields and see how difficult it is to bend over and take a, a good strawberry right from the field and make sure it's safe, food safety as well, to go right in those cartons, which go right to the shelves, and they'll go right into my daughter's mouth. You know, that's skilled labor. We know that out here. But it's making sure as a representative of this area that I continue to tell that story. And that they understand that uh, how important uh, immigration, immigrants, and immigration policy and reform. Are. Other questions, comments? Oh. Um, hi, my name's Bennett, and um, I'm a recently retired community college professor and counselor. And I just want to uh, applaud your bipartisanship efforts to get some decision making done. But I'm from a campus that has over a thousand enrolled dreamers. And what's the name? It's the Southern California okay. campus. And I see the fear that these students have. You, know, you give them hope and they take it away. And you know, if I can just encourage you to fight as much as you can for them. Uh, we need these kids. They want to do nothing but contribute to this country. And I, I can't understand how people would have known to have this happen to stay here. So, anyway, no, I'm happy. Look, I understand. That's why I told you the story about that, uh, that Republican member who was in my office. Uh, you know, look, there are states, not just districts, there are states with not one dreamer in there. You know, Maine, North Dakota. They don't, they don't, like I said, they don't need to touch this issue. Um, and it's actually based on the rhetoric that was spewed throughout the last year's campaign and even recently with these tough immigration principles that were put forward last Sunday by the White House. Uh, you know, it's, like I said, it can be a politically tough issue to touch for some Republican members. But be assured that not just me, but there are a number of Democratic members and some Republican members that are fighting for our dreamers. Carlos Cabello is from Miami, Republican moderate from Miami. And he's, he's put forward this piece of legislation called the RAC Act, Recognizing America's Children Act, that is very similar to the DREAM Act. And that's, he's one of the people in our discussions about how we can combine the DREAM Act and the RAC Act to basically come to a compromise. He's out there putting his neck on the line. I mean, we don't, we, you know, I, trust me, you know, we don't, we, he doesn't have to do this, but he is. There are people back there who are fighting for our dreamers, including myself. And we will continue to do that. I mean, look, I, I think ultimately, ultimately, this kind of be some inside baseball. Ultimately, I see the dream, I see uh, the, any deal with our dreamers and potentially any deal with those cost-saving reduction subsidies 
I could see those being tied into that December 8th budget negotiation that we talked about uh, and basically adding it on to that to be frank. Um, because obviously when it comes to a budget, there are members of the Republican Party, the Tea Party, who will not vote for any sort of budget where there's any sort of spending. Just, that's why they went to, got sent to Washington, D.C., they feel, to not vote on any sort of spending. Uh, is my, my impression. It's, you know, basically the government to do nothing. Um, but that's why the Republicans, leadership, they need the Democrat vote. Okay, they need Democrats to agree to that budget. And part of that is negotiations. What else can be in that? Uh, and if push comes to shove, if we can't come to a deal on the DREAM Act or the RAC Act or any other sort of immigration reform, I believe that leadership's intention, my guess, leadership's intention is to tie some sort of legislation dealing with their dreamers to the budget to get passed. No, that will not, I, I, I highly doubt that. Uh, the negotiations that I'm having with my Republican counterparts, they know we will not stand for a wall. That is not part of the negotiations, and it shouldn't be. Now, don't get me wrong. There needs to be border security. There needs to be technological improvements and advancements on our border security. That is, we, we Democratic leadership, Chuck Schumer has acknowledged that and is willing to make those a part of the negotiation. But that's not a wall. That's not an outdated 14th century wall. It's other forms of border security that I believe that we do need as a country. Um, how do we? Uh, as a community can support the work that you're doing in Congress representing us. No, I appreciate that. Look, I think the most important I ask of you is to keep me filled in as to what's going on here. Uh, I, you know, look, trust me, I'm here, every, I'm here every weekend. I come home every weekend, not only because it's my job and I get out in the district at, at least one of the two days, but I have a family here as well. My wife is a Superior Court judge. My daughters go to the same public schools that I went to. Uh, and this Sunday, I'll be out at the Salinas Softball Center watching my daughter play softball. I can't wait. Let me tell you, I can't wait. Um, but I'm here, and you'll see me. Contact me. Tell me what's going on. Call my office. Tell me what's going on. If there are issues that are happening that you feel like you didn't know about, call my office. I, I, you're going to hear me say call rather than email. I think that's more important. Uh, look, emails, I get it. And emails, email. It's always nice, I believe, for you to pick up the phone and have someone on the other side of the line actually take your information down, put it into our system, and actually take if there's any issues going on. Um, so feel free to call. Uh, just keep us informed. Do it before votes come up. The last thing I want you to do is sit there and say, well, why did you vote this way on this bill? And I say, well, did you contact my office? And you say, no. Trust me, I've had that happen. So you got to let us know what's going on. Like, keep that form of communication. That's the most important thing. Uh, you know, I've been here nine months. I, 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 I know what I don't know. Okay? And that's a lot. And I'm still learning this kid. All right? But I can tell you that, that you know, the way I learn it, the way I enjoy learning it, is my communication with you and talking to you and hearing about what's going on because I, I love this job and I love representing this area. And it only makes me a better representative the more I know. So I'm not afraid of that. I, I, I got to get going. I'm getting pulled out of here. Uh, we got to head up to Santa Cruz now. Um, but once again, like I said, thank you very much for what you're doing. And thank you uh, for your service, uh, not only like in your network, but also the fact that you are here to, I believe, to give back uh, to this country and community that has given all of us so much. Thank you very much.